wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor, the Boston stand-up comedian who's welcomed a guest each and every week since 2014 to the show to discuss classic television using back issues of TV Guide magazine from my personal collection as the gateway into our collective past. And I am incredibly excited for my guest this week. My guest is the one and only John Sales. If for some strange reason you don't know who John Sales is, uh, stop this podcast right now and and look him up and look up his work. He is uh, a writer, an actor, a novelist, a screenwriter, a director, um, and also just a good dude and a fascinating guy. He spent some real time with this, and uh, I am honored and flattered, and you will be very excited to hear this episode, as I am excited to present this episode to you, and as I was excited to record this episode. Uh, You can email me at tvguidancecounselor.gmail.com or ken at iCanRead.com with your thoughts, guest suggestions, whatever you may have. I love hearing from you guys. Let me know what you thought of this show. Let me know what you're watching. Let me know how you're doing. But in the meantime, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, the one, the only, Mr. John Sales. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. Live via satellite. John Sales, how are you, sir? I'm good. Uh, it's it's a little cold up here on the satellite, but uh, other than that, <laughs> it is in the atmosphere. Isn't great either. No. no. Oh, but I'm bumping. Yeah, I could really. Uh, <laughs> I can tell I haven't done stand up in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn you, damn you, COVID. I was very excited that, that you were interested in doing the show because I've enjoyed so much of the work that you've done. And I know you're a well-versed fan of so much stuff that sort mm-hmm. of you've talked about that incorporates into your work. So when you sent me your list of shows you watched, a lot of it just made perfect sense to me. Yeah, I think in my generation, um, TV was kind of a babysitter. And so I got to watch a lot of it. My brother and I, and mostly without my parents both worked. And so they were kind of fried by the time they got home. And, you know, it was rare that they sat down and watched anything with us, which was fine with us. You know, we had control. I I am assuming, you know, I I chose uh, June 3rd, 1960. I'm assuming this is far before you were born. It was. I was I was born in 1980. But uh, okay. as a young lad, I had horrible insomnia and I slept maybe two hours a night and my uh-huh. parents did not supervise me at all. Yeah. So I was up watching, you know, Night Flight on USA Network and uh, um, all the yeah. weird, you know, UHF stations at like three, four, uh, five. And, um, and those are like night commercials that go with them. Yes, absolutely. Stuff that I had no business watching, but I feel like made right. me a better person. <laughs> yeah. Just as a, as a groundation, in, in 1960, uh, I was 10 years old. There were only three channels, CBS, NBC, and ABC. PBS hadn't really kind of raised its head yet. I think it, it may have been called something like ETV, educational TV or right. something, something like that, but it, it wasn't all over the country. Color existed in TV, but we had a black and white TV. I didn't see a, a show in color until I was in college. Do you remember what the first and show was? It was a baseball game. I said, boy. The grass is green on the baseball field. <laughs> incredible. I had seen them like in, in a Western Electric, you know, store window, but I hadn't actually sat down. There was even, a, you know, Walt Disney's A Wonderful World of Color to rub it in to us who you know, didn't have color TVs. Um, and there were no remotes. So if you wanted to change to a different of those three channels, you had to get your butt out of the couch and walk four or five feet and actually flip the dial around. And there were like 
12 or 13 clicks on the dial. So oh, there, yeah. was, like, there was stuff, you know, with static in between the channels that you wanted. Uh, That's why people had more than stuff. one child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a remote that we made that can turn this. Cha- and, and obesity wasn't a problem as much because people had to get up to turn the channel. Yeah. Oh, actually, you, you did many laps going from <laughs> one to the other. Your Saturday night, one thing to remind, you know, as I go down this list, in 1960, there were 30 Westerns. Wow. On television, you know, on three networks. So th- that was the dominant genre. There were detective things were starting to come in. Um, there were a lot of um, kind of holdovers from the Playhouse 90 thing. So there was like Zane Grey Theater or whatever. Somebody would present something and it would be a different story each week. Um, but the, the, the Western... And I, you know, I don't know, you know, it's part of the American psyche and uh, it's part of the reason that we're fucked up probably. Yeah, uh, oh, for sure. <laughs> this idea that, you know, we're that lone gunman who can come into town and solve everybody's problems with a few well-placed bullets, right. um, which uh, w- works better on the Western village model than it does in, you know, Middle Eastern countries, let's say. My first Saturday one is have gun will travel, which was, you know, to, to, to stand out from each other, you had to find another twist on the Western. So this one is Richard Boone, who was, you know, kind of a serious actor. He'd mostly played um, heavies in, in, you know, early movies. Uh, he pl- in, in The Big Sleep with Humphrey Bogart. Love that he movie. Plays a character named Lash Canino. Uh, <laughs> I knew so movie. many Lash Caninos growing up. It was just... Yeah, like- exactly. <laughs> Um, but in this one, he plays this very refined guy. He lives in a hotel in San Francisco. He's a dandy. Uh, he's on the board of trade. You know, he drinks fine wines and wears lacy shirts. And uh, But he has his card that he hands out. Uh, Have gun will travel. And there is the, a chess piece on it, which is, is the horse. Uh, and his name is Paladin. Um, you know, he's a knight without armor. Um, and, uh, he's hireable. And if you're just some rich guy who wants something done where you need some, some heavy weight, uh, you pay a lot, but if you're poor and in need, he might show up and do it gratis. You know, he's a kind of pro bono gunfighter. (laughs) Um, and, and a lot of these guys did that. They're bounty hunters or whatever. And, but, but if somebody's in trouble, they're also social workers, right. you know, with, with good aim. Um, and he carried, and they all had a kind of distinct thing. Their weapons were distinct. And this guy carried a forty-five caliber Colt single action army cavalry model revolver with a very unusual rifled barrel. Uh, so it's kind of distinctive looking and a Derringer. Um, he's also a fencing master. Of course. And there are scenes of him in San Francisco getting Kung Fu lessons from Chinese guys. <laughs> so he's like the all purpose, you know, weapon. Historically uh, accurate. <laughs> yeah. And then and then on the job, you know, he, he wears black, which was unusual for, for the good guys. Um, and then important to all these westerns especially but all of these shows is um is the the theme song here a gun will travel read the card of a man a knight without armor in a savage land his vast gun for hire he's the calling wind A soldier of fortune is the man called Paladin. Paladin, Paladin, where do you roam? That was sung by a guy named Johnny Western, I assume not his birth name. (laughs) Um, And it became quite a hit. And so all of these, you know, these themes were, it's a half hour show. You know, as a TV writer, what you know about a half hour show is you're filling 22 minutes um, with the, the, you know, the the music in and the music out and the credits and about eight minutes of commercials. 
Um, so you got to tell your story pretty quickly yeah. and uh, in kind of broad strokes and everything like that. And that lead in is really part of the, the, you know, the juice of the show and the mood of the show. And it kind of sets the tone. Um, and this is one of the, one of the better ones. Next show I would have watched on that night, Wanted Dead or Alive. And you've probably seen this. This is Steve McQueen before he was a movie star. Mm -hmm. At this point, I think he'd he'd been in The Blob. Yes. uh, The original (laughs) Blob. World's Uh, oldest teenager in The Blob. Yeah. He plays Josh Randall, who's a a bounty hunter. And he carries a sawed-off Winchester rifle in a holster, which is very strange. And they're, they're actually... This was something that some people had in the Old West. It was known as a mare's leg, uh, but you draw it like a pistol, but it's you know, it has a better range. Um, you know, hard to sit down at a bar counter, <laughs> right? one of those on your hip. And the, the thing about him, um, you know, that, that just struck you right away with Steve McQueen is that, you know, he didn't have as much dialogue as, per, for instance, Paladin um, did. But he was one of the best physical actors who's ever graced the, any screen. He just moved cool. And, and that, you know, held him in, a, in good stead in his later movie career. And he was one of those guys like Charles Bronson who would just take a script and cross out lines. Right. And no, I'm cool. Yeah. You know, I just got to move across the screen and, you know, jack this guy up and, and that's enough. Still waters yeah. run deep there. <laughs> yeah. And the last one... Um, they have listed here on Saturday night as Ernie Kovacs. This is a show that was usually on earlier where I lived in Schenectady, New York. Uh, so I mentioned it's reruns. Ernie Kovacs had this very bizarre sense of humor. He's this guy from Buffalo, um, big face like a catcher's man. He was only in a couple movies uh, and very good in them. He, he was in um, Our Man in Nirvana playing like a Cuban torturer or something like that. It's kind of perfect. And um, what was strange about this is it it had no laugh track. So there's all these comedy bits, included silent ones with music and stuff like that, and no laugh track. And at that time, I Love Lucy is the big show. And, you know, you could recognize a show by its laugh track. Oh, that's I Love Lucy from the next room. So when I saw it, it was so the humor was so strange. And without the laugh track, it was kind of like pornography. I didn't like to look at it if my parents were in the room. <laughs> I'd switch the channel because I wasn't sure I was supposed to be watching it. And the thing I remember the most about that is they would often just go into this, uh, a number of sight gags while on the track, Lada Lenya would be singing Mac the Knife in German. Yes. So it's really trippy. And this is way before LSD, or I certainly wasn't doing any drugs in those days. Um, and that would be Saturday night. Um, you know, so you're starting with Westerns. And then if this is on, there's this bizarre, you know, from another planet kind of comedy. Yeah. Um, Ernie Kovacs is one of those guys that he was, he was doing comedy that understood how television worked. I think for the yes. first time he was, he was really using yeah. the medium to sort of, um, to sort of make the jokes and the gags, something unique. Yeah. It wasn't just radio stuff like the Nairobi Ni- yeah. trio. Um, that's yeah. the classic one window laugh track that is sort of scary, but also yeah. funny. Oh, it was bizarre. There, he did a thing. Um, it was a character named Eugene who was this schlubby guy and it was all done with sound effects. And there was no dialogue and he'd come and he'd do things that were funny. And he did one where he built a tilted stage and put a table on it and, you know, and, and, you know, nailed a few things down. And the guy comes and tries to, to eat his lunch and they tilted the camera too. So to the audience, it looks like it's, you know, horizontally flat. But every time he takes an orange out, it rolls off the table and right. you know, he tries to pour milk into his glass and it, it overshoots it. I mean, really very kind of visionary stuff. Sunday night, once again, started with a Western, which was The Rebel. This is an actor named Nick Adams, who's this like Ukrainian kid from the coal mining regions of Pennsylvania originally, as Johnny Yuma, who's this guy who's, who's riding around the West after the Civil War, still wearing his Confederate uniform. Of course. Because he's got a death wish. <laughs> It, it's kind of he he was a method actor, and so it's kind of like 
somebody from the beat generation who's been reading Jack Kerouac, <laughs> riding in town wearing a Confederate uniform, carrying a sawed off shotgun. So he means business and just about asking for a fight. Uh, <laughs> he's moody. He, got, he's, he was very good at being moody. And he was, uh, he was kind of a piece of work, Mick Adams. He was in Rebel Without a Cause, he was in a couple pretty good movies, and then he started doing real shocking movies. But he was a real kind of wannabe. He hung out with James Dean, and Dennis Hopper was a big friend of his. Uh, after James Dean died, he's hung out with Elvis a lot, he became part of Elvis's crew. Memphis Mafia guy. <laughs> yeah, and they'd drive motorcycles together and stuff like that. He eventually OD'd on prescription drugs when he was fairly young. Which is weird because this episode, if you read the description, Johnny learns that an old friend from his army days has become a drug addict. Yes, even in the Old West. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then the theme song was sung by some new country western guy. was a rebel he roamed through the west and Johnny Yuma was a rebel he wandered alone he got fighting mad this rebel lad he packed no star as he wandered far where the only law was a hook and a draw the rebel Yuma was a rebel, he roamed through the west, and Johnny Yuma was a rebel, he wandered alone, he searched the land, this restless lad, he was panther quick and leather tough, cause he figured that he'd been pushed enough to rebel. the first I ever heard Johnny Cash and um, you know I think he's he was like taking extra testosterone when he sang that it's real low and a lot of his, his, his and that became a hit you know and, and got some airtime once you had that intro you know you're kind of in the mood you know I, late in a later you know kind of uh, I think it was 70s um, Hawaii Five O had that great da, 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 da. Uh, uh, yeah and I used to just watch the intro, and I didn't like the series, so I would then switch to whatever was opposite it. But I, I never missed the intro, but, you know, bongos and all that kind of stuff. Then the other thing, uh, next thing I would watch would be Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents were very were kind of macabre, a little half hour tales with kind of ironic, grisly endings to them, with that kind of Hitchcock touch to them. He did not direct any of them that I, I remember, but he was the host. And they were two kind of notable things about it. The producer for many of them was Norman Lloyd, who was this wonderful character actor who just died this year at like 103 years old <laughs> and was compass mentis until the end. He's the guy in Saboteur who, who whose sleeve rips and he falls off the you know, the uh, Statue of Liberty, and he worked with Jean Renoir and all this. And he had been blacklisted. And Hitch, who liked working with him, said, well, look, you know, they, they're not going to blacklist you from being a producer, just an actor. And so it gave him a you know, good paying gig for years and years and years. And the other thing was, the most fun in the show was that the introductions were done by very tongue in cheek by Hitchcock himself. Mm -hmm. The theme um, was the funeral march of the marionettes, which was kind of semi-classical.
<laughs> playful and creepy that almost like yeah. I mean I think a lot of people have seen Alfred Hitchcock presents but if they haven't the the trailer for Psycho yeah. is essentially an opening of an Alfred Hitchcock presents for yeah. the movie Psycho the tone is very very kind of wry yeah. and you know and in that very kind of British way of we actually really love murder yes and yeah killer, you know isn't it fun uh, there's, there's an old um, British joke about um the newspaper reporting on a murder and just saying, well, the woman was found, you know, with her head separated from her body and she was eviscerated and, you know, one leg was found in this county and another one was found in this county and that the forensic people have ascertained that the young woman was not interfered with. <laughs> <laughs> she kept her dignity funny. there. Yeah. Did you ever get to meet any of these guys when you were... No, no. Unfortunately, you know, by the time I started working for the movies, most of these guys were gone. Later on, I'll get to Robert Stack, who I did oh, nice. get to, which was cool. The last one on, the, on that night, oh no, not the last one, Johnny Staccato, which is like the greatest name for a detective series. Fantastic. Um, it's kind of like Sex, Lies, and Videotape. You don't, you know, you're going to get people to watch, which starred John Cassavetes, very young, as a former jazz pianist, was he says, um, you know, his chops weren't that good, so he had to hand in his union card and get a detective's license. <laughs> As one um, does. And he works out of Greenwich Village, hangs out in a club called Waldo's, uh, which is owned by this character actor named Eduardo Cianelli, who's this very light blue-eyed Italian-American actor who usually played mafia dons. And it has this real film noir look and a lot of narration from Cassavetes, which, once again, if you're writing a half-hour show, it does a lot of work for you. Mm -hmm. You can explain half the plot. And the theme, once again, is a great theme. And it was written by Elmer Bernstein, a wonderful you know, movie composer who did things like the theme to The Magnificent Seven, which later became the Marlboro Cigarettes theme. <laughs> of course. And here's the here's Elmer Bernstein's thing. so aggressive it's almost too weird yeah. to be like a peter gunn kind of smooth yeah and and what's you know of course it being you know only 1960 the house band is all these west coast jazz guys shelly man's the drummer and they're all white yeah of course <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know and you know that was that and then finally sunday night ended with the ed sullivan show and the ed sullivan show there were variety shows in there. Perry Como had one, and they were all, usually an hour long. And you had this, you know, you had acrobats on, you had stand-up comedians on, you had singers, you know, famous and not famous singing songs. You had scenes from Broadway plays sometimes. Uh, he would introduce, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters, right. uh, Chamberlain or whoever had, you know, just won an Olympic gold medal. Um, he had been a, a sports columnist who then became an, an entertainment columnist um, in New York City. And then he, he, he just kind of was, I'm the toast of Broadway guy and I'm bringing you be the best of Broadway and, and who's in town. Uh, my favorite act, because it, once again, it was like Ernie Kovacs. It was so bizarre of why are people watching this? <laughs> Um, was a group called Johnny Paleo and the Harmonicats. Oh, yeah. Go online and look at these guys. Johnny Paleo was this little Italian guy who in those days would have been called a midget. Um, and then there were like five or six really guys with really long legs 
they all played harmonicas, usually playing a very upbeat version of, of hold that tiger. Yes. And then he would play. And then when they'd finish, he'd come over and bite Ed Sullivan on the ankle. There's an SCTV episode where they do a parody of oceans 11 with um, <laughs> Sammy Maudlin and uh-huh. the harmonica gang is in it. It's the yeah. weirdest thing. It's like 1980 or 81. Yeah. And clearly they grew Cause it's supposed to take place in the sixties and you know, yeah. And it's so bizarre because they're also, they're probably 70 something at this point in this thing. And it's just out of context. So weird. Uh, Yeah. It it helped watching that show, SCTV, (laughs) it helped to have watched as much TV as I had and movies because it's so referential. My favorite bizarre bit of theirs was a, uh, a children's cartoon show hosted by Old Muley, who's a character in the movie they made of... Uh, Grapes of Wrath, yes. who's this guy who's stayed on even though his farm has been, you know, kind of burned down and there's just dust everywhere. And he's this kind of, you know, mopey guy. And, he, you know, kids don't like old Muley. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even want to hear him say anything. Here's another cartoon. That's yeah. where I learned that stuff, which is funny. I got yeah. this sort of you know, the, the, the generation of people who started making television that grew up on television and yeah. started doing this sort of one step removed stuff. That's how I sort of, sort of the mad magazine, uh, you know, yeah. learning through parody Going things. backwards. Oh yeah. Ed Sullivan eventually kind of, he introduced the Beatles to the United States. They were on his show and eventually the Rolling Stones and stuff like that. And of course they're lip syncing, but the screaming every, you know, he made pretend that he wanted them to calm down. Um, And uh, I saw that night, and I also saw a great night where somehow whoever had to hit the censor button wasn't quick enough. There was a wonderful comedian named Jackie Mason. And Jackie Mason was a real horse belt guy. And he was going over, uh, you know, his allotted time, which was probably two minutes and 13 seconds, or, you know, maybe three minutes and, and 16 seconds. And uh, they were giving him the signal to to hurry up, and he went, "Oh, you want you got the signal for me? I got a signal for you, and for you." And he's flipping the bird. All, and they got like two or three of them in before they cut away. Um, I think to a commercial for you know hairspray or something like that. <laughs> I don't know if you looked at the lineup here on this one, but it's Count Basie and his orchestra yes. with Joe Williams, Charles Chaplin Jr. Yeah, who Prof- I never heard of. Me either. Uh, Professor Backwards, uh-huh. uh, musical comedy star Cheetah Rivers, uh, comedian Gene Carroll, and the comedy team of Ford and Reynolds, the High Lads, the comedy vocal quartet, and the Ducats. Yeah. And and I don't remember half of those. There were people who were on it like 20 times. I, I worked with a stand-up guy named Alan King, who oh, yeah. was also an actor. And he was on it a lot. You know. But they always did the same damn act. This is before, you know, everybody had an iPhone and could, you know, steal your act. And, and it would be on the web the next day. And you would just wait a year and you have the same guy on. And, oh, I like that routine. Do that again. Yeah. People you forgot. Know, so people forgot. And what it what it meant when that show was ending is you got the sick feeling in your stomach because you had to go to bed and tomorrow was Monday morning and you had to get behind the mule and go back to school. Yep. The Sunday so scares. I had a very bittersweet, you know, oh God, this is it. You know, it, it's, it's curtains, you know, <laughs> and so the show was ending. Monday, this is getting back to these, these kind of jazzy TV shows. There was Peter Gunn. And Peter Gunn was played by a guy named Craig Stevens. And he uh, was a show created by Blake Edwards, who later became a very successful director. He did all those Peter Sellers as Inspector Clouseau movies. And, you know, uh, he was married to, you know, what's her name, who played Mary Poppins. And he was not a musician, but he hung out at a jazz club um, called Mother's. And a lot of the same white jazz players on the West Coast were in the band. Um, <laughs> Coincidentally. The same drummer and stuff like that. <laughs> Including the pianist was a guy who later became Steven Spielberg composer, John Williams. Oh, I didn't even know he that. All the jazzy piano riffs on it. You know, and he was a, obviously a young guy and it was a good gig. And then this had the most 
classic opening that even if you didn't like the show, you watched the opening. This was to the point where I think the art of noise and Dwayne Eddy had a top 10 hit with a remake yeah. of this in the late eighties when yeah. this show hadn't aired even in reruns in decades, but the song kept going. You can imagine every garage band because of that great guitar line. Oh, yeah. And very often, if they had uh, a keyboard, um, all the horns would be done by a guy on electric organ. Uh, keyboards weren't very sophisticated back then, but you could at least do those sustained notes on on an or- electric organ. Um, and, you know, it was, once again, it was a half hour show. And so you had to be very, very efficient. And I can't remember the plot of any of these episodes. <laughs> on any of these shows because they were so kind of generic right. and there was something comforting about that. You know, there was an arc to them. Usually you'd go back to the club at the end and they'd play some more jazzy music. Yeah. It was not ambiguous at all. We started to see that a little bit later, like in the mid to late sixties when we started getting stuff like branded or, you know, the prisoner and that stuff. But at this point it's very black and white. Were you the kind of kid that was, dissecting these like were you learning structure and stories just by watching them maybe not even knowingly yeah well until the late 60s and you start to get Sergio Leone movies coming here and oh they don't shave every day (laughs) and they sweat you know (laughs) and bounty hunters are just kind of scummy guys you know um things changed a little bit especially in westerns um, you know, that anti-hero had not hit the planet yet, at least not planet USA. Um, next was another Western, Tales of Wells Fargo, <laughs> which was a guy with another great deep voice, Dale Robertson, who was also, uh, he was one of the, the intro guys and narrators on a, a series, um, you know, brought to you by 22 Real Team Borax. <laughs> uh, and in this one, he plays Jim Hardy, who was a left-handed gun, which I like because I'm left-handed. And he's not just a cowboy. He's a special agent for the Wells Fargo Company, you know, which was already a banking and stage company. You know, if you see their logo, it's still got the stage coaches in them. Um, so he does a lot of kind of – he can pretend to be a bad guy for a while and then turn out to be a good guy in order to get the – he's, 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 a, he's a Western detective. Undercover um, bounty hunter. Yeah. Uh, we lived in, in um, you know, uh, Santa Barbara for a while when I started working for the movies. And Wells Fargo was my bank. And I had stagecoaches on the checks, which was very cool. Uh, and then the last one on Monday night was a show that I would watch like five or ten minutes because I, I just, what the, what's going on? Here? <laughs> it was called Adventures in Paradise. It was based on some stories by James Michener, who usually wrote these great big fat things. And he he had wrote the the stories because he was he was stationed in the South Pacific um, during World War II. Um, that South Pacific, the musical was you know uh, based on, and he wrote things like Alaska, and it would be you know fifty five hundred pages. I should talk. I write books. <laughs> um, and it starred a guy named Gardner McKay who was very upfront about, I am not an actor. <laughs> and I never really wanted to be an actor, but he was so good looking um, that the show got good ratings for at least the first year because women wanted to tune in and see this guy sailing around Tahiti. <laughs> and as far as I could remember, that's mostly what he did. He did a lot of sailing. 
with not that many clean shorts on and stuff yeah. like that. So he looked good. Um, and they, he very shortly after their series got canceled after maybe two years, uh, he just quit and became an artist who lived in interesting places and had lions. That's not uh, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, he was famous for showing up at parties with a lion. I believe. <laughs> oh, he's that guy. Yeah. It's like yeah. the guy who shows up with a guitar to a party and then the guy yeah, who shows up with a lion. He Ricardo is. Montalban is in that episode as well. Yes. Well, he, he looks good in a Hawaiian shirt. Absolutely. Uh, and and he, he has a, a permanent tan, Ricardo Montalban. Yes, indeed. He's actually a pretty good actor. Uh, if you see some movies from the late 40s, uh, when he was a young guy, it's surprising because sometimes he's the lead in them. Mm-hmm. And he's this Hispanic guy who's not totally white and everything. And he was very charming and everything. Later on on TV and Love Boat Days, he seemed like a retired actor. He's phoning it in. You know, who's still in front, but but you know a comfortable guy. Yeah, and more like the host of the show than acting in it. Um, um, the, on Tuesday, there was a comedy show called Dobie Gillis, which was a real piece of Americana. It's about this kind of regular American teenager uh, who just can't get a date and. You know, he's a nice guy and he's a crew cut blonde kid. And um, his best friend, uh, the the actor who played him, Dwayne Hickman, had a brother, Daryl, who was a twin brother who also acted. Um, His best friend is a beatnik, um, a totally bearded beatnik called Maynard G. Krebs, somehow still going to an American high school, (laughs) uh, even though he looked about 30. Um, uh, and it was played by Bob Denver, who later was Gilligan on Gilligan's Island. Uh, and I remember it's one of the first things I noticed about a transition. Uh, they did a verbal transition on this, which, you know, there, there are jump cuts and there are swish pan cuts like they used on the man from uncle. And this was a verbal cut, which would, they would have somebody else in a scene and a sentence with the word work. And then they cut the energy crabs going work, you know, as if you know his hair was standing on an end. And right. The word itself could make him, you know, quell. Um, and early the first year of this was interesting because Lauren Beatty was on it as well right. as Tuesday Weld. And there's some great stuff online of scenes between the two of them, and they're so good looking. Yes. Um, his character eventually got. Um, you know, uh, replaced by a, a guy who played Chatsworth Osborne the Third, who was the rich kid, right? Uh, by a wonderful, obnoxious actor. Um, it's very and, similar to Archie. It's sort of like yeah. I think it pre, it's around the same time as Archie, but it's that similar sort of high school archetypes. I, I think they probably had Archie in mind, just as uh, a later series um, uh, that what you know. Um, uh, was Route Route sixty six? Yes, was a, a guy who wanted to buy on the road from Jack, Jack Kerouac, and the guy wouldn't sell. He says, "Well, I'll do my own version," <laughs> you know. But instead of you know, hopheads, we'll have one guy who's like working class hophead, and then the others like a rich guy who has a Corvette. Totally different thing. So they have a really nice car yeah. instead of a piece of Detroit shit. Um, uh, after this came The Rifleman, another Western, with Chuck Connors, who was this big, tall, I think he played in the, the Celtics, Angeles Dine, Dodgers, you know, I mean, he may, may have come up for a cup of coffee and played in the majors for a couple games, um, playing Lucas McCain, and uh, Johnny Crawford played his son, Mark, and there was always a line during it where, son, have you done your chores? <laughs> And I, I was so glad that I didn't have chores that included slopping hogs and, you know, mending barbed wire. You know, I had things I had to do at 10 years old already, but none of them were chores like that kid had to do before. And they were in television. So after you did your chores, what was, you know, oh, let's go into town and see my father shoot somebody. Buy some uh, gingham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Chuck on it, uh, uh, Lucas McCain carried this kind of trick rifle that you could kind of jack the lever and, and get off a lot of shots. And that was the, the introduction of just, just watching his hand on the lever of this thing, blowing something away. <laughs> After that was M-Squad. And this is, this is a show most people don't remember. 
This starred Lee Marvin um, as Lieutenant Frank Ballinger, who was, uh, you know, the, the head of a Chicago special unit, you know, for the Chicago cops. Most, much of it shot in Chicago. Oh, wow. Um, he carried two Colt um, uh, snub-nosed revolvers. Um, he was the first guy, cop on TV, to have a backup. <laughs> These were, you know, probably because the real Chicago cops were carrying them. Yeah, uh, I think he's carried his in the in the back of his pants, not in his, you know, in his shoe or anything like that. Um, and there was an interesting incident that happened with one of the episodes had, and you'll, this will be hard to believe, a corrupt Chicago cop in it. What? <laughs> Mayor Daly, who was kind of, you know, uh, later notorious in Chicago, got so upset by this, he banned TV and movies from shooting in Chicago for years. Wow. And they had to recreate things in, in L.A. on the studio, which I'm sure was even cheaper for them. But that ban for, for several years, nothing was shot in Chicago <laughs> because somebody had the effrontery to suggest that one of Chicago's finest might be corrupt. This sounds uh, like almost like the real, not real life, because it's a TV show, but the contemporary version of like Crime Story. The yeah, indie show. well, and, and that was Chicago, and, and that was Michael Mann. Yep. And, and it had guys with real Chicago accents, <laughs> right. and, you, know, you know, being one of them. Um, and this had a wonderful thing uh, uh, that was um, by Count Basie. And wow. Count Basie um, took a riff, I think, from Night Train, which is kind of a, a famous uh, stripper song, and he did this great thing. Which police squad really well today <laughs> here we have police squad police squad in color they didn't go too far no. just enough to not get sued <laughs> starring leslie nielsen And I'm sure they watched 10 Squad episodes. Oh, no, no doubt about it. At the same kind of narration. Did Joe Dante direct a couple of episodes of Police he did Squad? Some of the early, the early TV episodes <laughs> of, of Police Squad. Um, and, um, you know, before it became the, the Naked know, Gun. Naked Gun ones, uh, which was only last about six episodes. Yeah. And the network didn't get it. And they're wonderful. They're they're really, really so really bizarre and surreal and like stuff you yeah. can't believe they even got on the air. My favorite bit was that at the end, it was supposed to be such a cheap show that when they ran the credits, everybody just froze. Yeah. And like the perpetrator who was in the room would look around and realize, well, I don't have to freeze and he'd stop her outside. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I remember about this show is that most of the ads were for Paul Mall cigarettes and Lee Marvin did them. Oh, wow. Uh, smoking and talking. You know, this, this is still, you know, heavy cigarette days, you know, when, when people, you know, even the news people smoked. Doctors. You know, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm a cigarette man, not a medical man. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he smoked quite a bit during the show as well. Wednesday night had an hour show called Wagon Train. And that was a big Western. Each episode was the so-and-so story. And, you know, with an hour, you have a different format. You can really tell. You have probably got 45 minutes to tell your stories. You can, you can take your time. And then, you know, and there's a lot of soap opera to it. But usually it was a different guest star every week. And then they would have some problem to work out while they're going westward. And the Wagon Master in 60 was still played by Ward Bond who, if you look at his filmography, was in like 300 movies. Uh, he was in almost every John Ford movie, Western, ever made. Uh, and he died uh, later in, in this year, in November of 1960, and was replaced by a character actor named John McIntyre. And there's a great story that um, Ward Bond and John Wayne 
and Andy Devine were the biggest right wingers in Hollywood. Oh yes. Uh, um, and uh, but they were always in John Ford movies, and John Ford was kind of an FDR liberal, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that. Then. And so when Ward Bond died, there was going to be a memorial for it right during John Ford shooting a western that Andy Devine was in. He said, "Okay." You know, I'm going this morning. I want you setting up the shot. I don't want any of you out to go. I'll tell you how it is and be ready for me when I come back and we'll start shooting. So he goes and he comes back and Andy Devine, who's this character, this big fat character guy with a really funny voice, you know, comes up and says, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, how was Ward's memorial? And uh, John Ford, who was known as a prickly character, <laughs> um, said, uh, well, Ward's dead. Now you're the biggest asshole in Hollywood. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> then the other the other shot on this night, um, it, it played in the morning uh, where I live, was The Millionaire. And The Millionaire had this great premise. Marvin Miller was kind of a character actor and an announcer with a great voice. The show would, would start, you'd meet some like troubled couple in the intro. And then he would look at the, you know, the camera, Marvin Miller, said, my name is Michael Anthony. And until his death just a few years ago, I was the executive secretary to the late John Beresford Tipton, a fabulously wealthy and fascinating man whose many hobbies included his habit of giving away $1 million tax-free each week to persons he had never even met. So, you know, you see the predicament these people are in. And then this guy shows up in a little bow tie and he says, you know, I can't, you know, you have to promise not to reveal you know, right. where you got this from. And a million dollars in 1960 is like 9.5 million now. <laughs> so this is serious coin he's giving out. And then you see how it works out. So it was a great premise and they had good guest stars and everything like that. Um, and I think Americans love this idea. Of oh, yeah. That's the American dream. Whatever, you know, is, you know, who wants to be a millionaire? Right. Uh, so this, 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 I think it might have even started on, on radio, this show. It was just great format. And even though Marvin Miller, and he, he really wasn't, he introduced the show and he did the outro and he showed up once and handed over an envelope and then <laughs> people like ruined their lives because they had too much money. <laughs> right. Um, Thursday started with another Western, Bat Masterson. The whip. Who was, uh, Wyatt Earp's um, deputy. And this was going on at the same time that The Legend of Wyatt Earp was playing. Um, and there was another actor playing Bat Masterson. So they were kind of <laughs> dueling Bat Masterson's on. And Gene Barry played this. It was kind of a debonair actor who, who wasn't only in Westerns. And his version of Bat Masterson was a bit of a dude. So he he carried a gold tip topped cane, he wore fancy vests and a derby instead of a cowboy hat. Um, and was a you know kind of a little more erudite. The real Bat Masterson actually was not only a deputy marshal, but a sports promoter. He he promoted some of the earliest heavyweight fights. Oh wow. Came to New York and worked for the, I think, the New York world as a sports writer. And he's the guy who um, Sky Masterson uh, is based on in, in Guys and Dolls. Oh, wow. He became quite a Broadway figure. And then The Untouchables, which was my favorite show. You know, I know, I know you, you lived in London, I think, for mm -hmm. a while. You know, British people grow up and they know the secessions of, of kings. Mm-hmm. I grew up knowing the secession of Chicago gangsters, <laughs> you know, so from like Johnny Tario and Al Capone through Murray the Camel Humphreys and all the way to Rica. Yeah, you know, I knew, you know, who took over from who, you know, and and, you know, the whole deal with with uh, Al Capone is that he was Napolitano and not Sicilian. Yeah, you know, so he was, you know, and, and it had deteriorated by the time Humphreys came around. There's a, a Welsh guy running, you know, the mafia in Chicago. Because Sicilians was La Cosa Nostra, but the Napole... The, the, well, it, yeah, it was really just like a neighborhood thing, you right. know. And you were not in the Unione Sutiliano, you, you weren't really one of the guys. Right. 
And so he was kind of an outsider from New York who came with Johnny Torrio and they muscled in. And but most of the guys working for him were Sicilians, you know, and then they brought the Sicilians back in and the Omerta that went with it. And uh, that kind of held reign. Um, so Robert Stack, who, if, if you started watching TV later, was the host of Unsolved Mysteries, had a great kind of husky. Eight, great seven, voice. six, five, three, uh, five, three. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I played Ring Lardner and, and directed the movie Eight Men Out, um, I played him using Robert Stack's voice. <laughs> uh, Good there choice. Was, like, um, there was a line in it where I said, you lied to me, Eddie. And it was, <laughs> Or at least it's Dan Aykroyd doing Robert Stack. Yes, <laughs> and I and it absolutely filled all the, the filled all the lines that I I wrote for that guy. Um, and the, you know the other thing that was great about this was um, the intro and narration by Walter Winchell. Walter Winchell was another TV news columnist who then became a radio guy, and he had this very kind of high staccato way of talking. And his radio show always started with. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the hits at sea. Uh, and he talked really fast, so he got a lot in, you know, whether it was Broadway gossip or real news. Um, and so here's a little bit of Winchell. In 1934, Prohibition had been repealed, and the Capone mob, without its leader, serving time at Alcatraz prison, was desperate for new sources of revenue. With the instinct of jackals for an easy kill, they picked the nation's small theater owners for their prey. The type of operation used was one they knew best, extortion. On a quiet street in Oak Park, Illinois, suburb of Chicago, Harold Coleman was closing his theater. Coleman was the owner and operator of two small motion picture houses. He thought he hadn't an enemy in the world, but he was soon to learn that he was mistaken. To put their extortion plan into operation, the Capone mob had chosen Frank Nitti, longtime enforcer for Scarface Al Capone. Neville Brand, who was a wonderful kind of, you know, gravelly voiced character actor with, uh, who had been, uh, he and Audie Murphy were among the most decorated soldiers in World War II. And wow. The uh, he played Capone in several episodes. Um, and, and was pretty good at it. Uh, and then they, they, this, this kind of thing happened where after the first season, there was some kind of Italian American anti-defamation society and they complained that you're making us look bad. Well, come on guys. <laughs> History is <laughs> making you look bad. <laughs> and they, and the TV show totally backed off. So they had to come up with these kind of neutral names <laughs> You know, you know, mafioso Johnny Smith. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, for the guys, and and I, I still like the show, but it was like I know who they're really talking about. <laughs> right. you know? That's Pittsburgh Phil, you know, Giancardi, and that's you know Frankie Uwali, Frankie Yale, and whoever it was. Um, and that that basically was my favorite show and it was it was an hour and they could really get into things and when you'd hear Winchell doing his intro there's a lot of machine guns going and stills being broken up and just general mayhem but also he could come in and move the plot forward right so he could you know do exposition as part of the storytelling and really move things ahead and then Robert Stack could be very terse and you know Rico Youngblood you know go do this thing and my, his, his favorite line of mine is some gangster, you know, said he was going to do something to me. He says, you don't have the moxie. <laughs> and then people are saying, what's moxie? I thought it was a soft drink. For me, he's a guy who I always wish did more comedy. Like he, he has that sort of so deadpan in, in from what I've heard from people who work with him was actually a pretty funny guy. I met him once. My, my first movie got an award from the Los Angeles Film Critics um, Committee or whatever, association. And they had a TV show where they presented the awards to get like people on television. And all the presenters were people who were in between series. Right. So like Fernando Lamas, and, <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, Dean Martin's son. And right. uh, I remember... Um, uh, um, 
what's her name, uh, Nastasia Kinsky. Oh, yeah. There, because Roman Polanski got an award, but he was already on the lam. Right. And so she had to accept it for him. And I, I thought, oh, it's some producer's daughter. She was this little girl in a prom dress. You know? Right. And so I'm at a table with Robert Stack, who's, you know, introducing my award. And he's the funniest guy. They're kind of hokey jokes. And he had just done 1941. And that started him into the kind of airplane mode of, you know, L- being the, the deadpan guy like Leslie Nielsen, you know, who after he started doing, you know, that, you couldn't go back and watch one of the straight parts. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> because you can't take anything. So he yeah. played the Swamp Fox for Disney. And it's just yeah. like, oh, come on, where's the jokes? It you ruined know? Forbidden Planet for me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's Frank Drebin, and right. uh, you can't get out of it once you've seen it. Um, uh, but yeah, he was he was actually a, a kind. He had been a skeet shooting champion in one of his early movies. He actually got to shoot skeet, you know, and they, they could do it in one shot instead of cutting away. But cool guy. Then Friday night, I always watch Friday Night Fights, and they have them here. Um, was actually the full name was the Gillette Cavalcade of Sports, <laughs> and uh, sounds less violent. <laughs> brought to you by Gillette and Sharpie the parrot, who was a cartoon parrot. And um, let's see if I can find a boxing theme. Gillette Cavalcade of Sports is on the air. <laughs> Way more upbeat than I'd expect for uh, uh, pugilism. <laughs> yeah, and, and boxing is perfect for having one sponsor. It's a razor. Guys watch boxing. They have to shave. Right. They may have light, regular, or heavy beards. Right. So I guess there's a different razor for each. You know, one goes with technology. Um, and Sharpie the parrot is dancing around as they're doing their their song. Uh, and there's one minute in between rounds. So you have three minutes of action and then one minute to sell razors and then you're back, you know, watching people knock the shit out of each other. It's pre uh, On right? this particular night, what's interesting for me is that Emil Griffith is fighting and I saw him fight a lot. He's a guy from the Virgin Islands. Incredible build. I mean, it's like the Marvel people drew this guy. Uh, incredible muscles. Um, and uh, he was early in his career. He was mostly winning. And some by knockouts. He fought a, a Cuban guy named Benny Perret three times. And I was one of the kids at thir- at 12 years old watching their third fight when he killed Benny Perret. In the ring live. In the ring live. champion is Emil Griffith, but we're more concerned about the condition of uh, Benny Kid Perret than we are about the title at the moment. Uh, we're going to have an interview with the winner. The time is 2.09 of this round. We'll have an interview with uh, Emil Griffith as sure as uh, as soon as we find out how Benny Kid Perret is. The time, two minutes and nine seconds. Of the 12th round, the winner by a knockout, and once again, welterweight champion of the world. Emil Griffith was bisexual, 
not much of a secret, really. And Benny Perrette had given them some shit and called them Maricom when they were, were in the, you know, the weigh-in. And so Emil Griffith was out for blood. They had split the other two fights. And at some point, he caught him up against the rope. And the guy's one arm was kind of wrapped around the rope. So he couldn't fall, but he could also knock it up. And he hit him about 13 or 14 times with nothing between them and his fist, thinking, well, why isn't he going down? Right. And finally, the referee got there and pulled him away. And, and I still remember him, Benny Perrette, slowly oozing to the, 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 the canvas and me saying, I think he's dead. And he, he didn't die uh, for another 10 days or so. Um, but, you know, d- before, you know, seeing um, Jack Ruby get killed on television, that was the only time I saw someone got killed on TV. Right. The last of them is kind of a, a classic. And uh, this is The Twilight Zone. Yeah. Which I never missed and was pretty new at this time. And Rod Serling, who was the main writer and wrote several of the episodes, never directed any, um, did this incredible intro. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Sometimes even appear, and and he, you know, there'd be a little intro scene left, and then he'd appear again, and he'd introduce the episode and say, you know, witness so and so, and this is. You know, strange shit's going to happen to him. Yeah, <laughs> and it was it was my introduction to irony because it always ended ironically. So if Burgess Meredith played the guy who was a bookworm who loved to read, and everybody else gets killed except for him, and he goes in the library and he says, "Oh, isn't this wonderful? No, he's going to bother me." Of course, he drops his glasses and steps on them. Yes, um, and can't find his way out to another optician shop i guess uh, <laughs> thinking of smelt his own lenses <laughs> yeah and some of them were kind of grisly some were funny some were very uh advanced science fiction but they always had this kind of twist at the end which you know as a kind of burgeoning writer is oh i get it that's that's how much irony you can get away with in 22 <laughs> minutes uh, <laughs> And wonderful guest stars. You know, oh, yeah. Robert and, you know, people became famous actors later. And then a lot of people basically stayed in TV and they're familiar, but you you don't really know your names. Yeah, that's uh, a show that I feel like made us all better people, <laughs> uh-huh. I would say, because of the allegory. Well, the quality was high, for one thing. Mm. They they later made a, a feature uh, based on a one of, of – um, Serling's episodes uh, got turned into Requiem for a Heavyweight. Mm-hmm. That was on Playhouse 90. But there was a, a Twilight Zone called Steel that Lee Marvin was in. And he, and he plays a guy, and it's kind of in the future, and they've banned real boxing. But people have lifelike machines that they box, and they have this old model. <laughs> and it's breaking down. And they just want to get one more fight out of it. And they've booked a fight and the thing breaks apart. And but they're going to get, you know, kicked out of the boxing business if they don't show up for this date and and miss the bout. And so Lee Marvin says, well, look, I can last three rounds. I'll just (laughs) pretend to be, you know, and it's called steel. And he goes out there and takes the beating of his life. It's like a Hemingway story. There's a wonderful uh Hemingway story called 50 grand where a guy who has thinks he's going to lose, he's the champ, but he, he knows he's getting old and he's going to lose this young kid uh, takes 50 grand to throw the fight. And in the first gr- round, he like taps this guy and the guy almost goes down and he has to hold him up for the three rounds. And then, you know, basically um, decides, well, I'm not going to look bad 
you know, this punk doesn't deserve the championship. So he hauls off and hits him in the balls with an undercup. <laughs> qualified. So he at least gets the satisfaction of seeing the guy taken off. Everybody know. wins. And, and he, you know, he gets the 50 grand and he doesn't look bad. And, uh, but, it, you know, so the quality once again was very high, like Alfred Hitchcock, even though it was, you know, just kind of regular TV. Yeah. So that was pretty much, you know, that my and then my parents would go to bed and like you I would get up again and keep the volume <laughs> to see what weird shit going on you know and it only came on until midnight in 1960 and then there was a, te- a test pattern a patriotic sign off too that was well like... yeah they would have the, the Star Spangled Banner and a lot of missiles and things like yeah. that and or, or else they would have. Um, a lot of aircraft and rockets and a guy kind of talking in italics doing this poem. I have slipped the surly bonds. <laughs> and, you know, and that would be the end. And then the test pattern, eh, and you'd look at the test pattern until you said, well, I got to go to sleep. Now. Have you seen Ted Turner's uh, completely sincere sign off for the end of the world that he made? Oh, no, in in case it really happened. Yeah, so when CNN started, he had them make basically like a tape to play on Doomsday to sign off. And someone leaked it a couple years ago. And it's basically everything you described, except it's 1985 or 6. And it's like, well, here we had a good run, everybody. Like, it's so weird. Yeah, footage from the Atlanta Braves when they were (laughs) winning a World Series and doing the job. Oh, God. Did it all. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. you doing this. And uh, and I love the series. Oh, um, thank I'm you. Interesting to see. Um, there's a lot of stuff I never saw. And some of it I might even try to track down. Oh, yes. Yeah. some of it I have been warned against. So. <laughs> well, I'd love to hear what you think if you track any of it down. <laughs> That was John. I mean, what else can I say? What an amazing guy. Uh, I, again, cannot thank him enough for taking the time to talk with me about classic television. Uh, We didn't even get into Square One TV, uh, which, you know, I'll I'll have to talk to him about at some point in the future. Uh, And just so much amazing work that he's done. Um, Thank you guys so much for listening to the show. Truly, I mean that. uh, It's, uh, you know, we're we're almost at episode 500 here. I think we're 10 away. Uh, I cannot believe I've done 500 episodes of this show, but I'm still enjoying it, still having great guests, and still uh, blown away by the people I get to talk to.